All right, so uh, let's go. Hype Pod episode 16. We just got Pastor Adam and myself because our co host, Arun, we just keep losing co hosts. Man, we go through them. <laughs> they can't handle the heat. Now, nah, he can handle it. He's just on vacation. So he's in, Where is he? Like, he's in J- J- Japan. Yeah, he's something? in Japan. So crazy. He just texted us the other day. You know, I always think that when people go to Japan, it's such a strange vacation spot. I'm sure Japan's awesome. I mm. want to go myself. But I feel like I want to go when I've got some business to do. Sure. It's not really like, hey, I want to just go and relax in Japan because my, and maybe I'm just, my perspective's off, but I feel like Japan is like more intense mm. than, than where I live. And so sure. do I want to go somewhere more intense for a vacation? I think people go for food, right? Some yeah. Sushi, sashimi. Yeah. You know, Jiro Sushi of Dreams, Netflix, kind of put it on the map. The okay. craftsmanship of the Japanese people, mm. culture. Okay, like now that. I want to go. All right, change my <laughs> mind. <laughs> well done. <laughs> it's funny because, uh, you know, tech people in general, I feel like this is happening. Travel is going crazy. I don't even yes. think that some people are even stopping working. They're just, no. they're no. just, they're everywhere. working. Exactly. They're traveling and working. Mm. The term for it is gangbusters. It's going gangbusters. Right. It's going for it because it's actually not just travel. I think one of the, the highest trending uh, areas right now is luxury travel. Right. Luxury travel. Like, you know, the, the trips that are pretty much an amazing bougie experience and, uh, you know, you pay for the premium quality, premium tickets, all that kind of stuff. So it tells me that there's still money out there to burn. There's money out there. There is this desire for novelty, I feel like. I feel okay. like there's this desire for adventure, exclusivity. Uh, people are still living based on the gram, Yeah, I feel like. Yeah. Uh, do you see that continuing? Let's talk about innovation really quick. We know a friend that invested actually into this space, luxury travel. Is this, is this like no sign of stopping? You know, it's, here's, here's what I think we're going to define. What's a trend? And is there a trend back to what would be our normal state? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That we'd be looking at. What, like, what's the normal state of living? What's the normal state of, of? I think sometimes in our mind we think the normal state is saving, buying, um, establishing, building wealth to hand on to the next generation. But is the new normal state a move away from that to not even think generationally, but just to experience life in your lifetime? And leave the next generation to their own devices. Right. I don't. I don't know if there is a if there is going to be a swing back because it doesn't look like it really doesn't look like this whole talk of inflation um, or recession has really started to affect a lot of what we see in the millennials or Gen Z generation in their spending. But what is happening is that they're just getting more and more into credit card debt. Oh, for sure. That's the problem. We've never been as indebted as a country in credit yeah. card debt. Yeah. So I think it's going to come to roost at some point. It has to. We will see the recession. Actually, I was looking at uh, these stats the other day from just an economist point of view that whenever there has been an inverted relationship between short-term yields and long-term yields. So for example, you can make more money investing into three-month treasuries right now right. than 10-year treasuries. And right. that never happens, right? right? I mean, that happens occasionally, but every time it does happen where it's inverted like that, it precedes a recession. Absolutely. And we, we just haven't seen the recession yet. Absolutely. <laughs> I think you got to look at it, right? I mean, we, we go back to 2020, 2021. I mean, everyone wanted to get in angel investing mm-hmm. into an early stage startup because of what the yield was going to be. Yep. But right now, the, the market is so, so uh, I would say, dry that you really got to consider is, you know, investing in an index fund going to yield more as yep. a result. And so I think, yeah, spending is up. Mm-hmm. I don't think uh, in the right areas. Definitely, right. I think keep people consuming. Maybe this is just a blow on still from the the mentality of the the fragility of the lockdown season. Mm-hmm. You know, people who were saving and then all of a sudden you're locked down and the threat of missing out on life experiences. And maybe now people are just making up for lost time still. One principle that I do think that people should consider is to be – uh, greedy when people are playing it safe, but be safe when people are playing it greedy. Right. So what I mean by that is if people are being so wasteful in this season and spending any last, you know, reserves that they have on things like luxury and, and things that are fleeting, this is the time to actually invest. Right. This is actually the time to invest 
especially as prices continue to go down and down. And so if you have dry powder and you see real estate markets in the Bay Area depressed, yep. those are the times to buy. For sure. Not to be scared, yeah. to operate um, with boldness, right? Yeah, this is, this is essentially, I think, what makes a key innovator is being disruptive. So when everyone is zigging you, Zach, exactly. when, when there is a pathway that everyone seems to be treading, you should be going, how do I go in the opposite direction? Yes. Or how do I actually optimize? I think that's what we see in a lot of wealth creation, right? We, we see uh, key figures over history who have uh, accelerated is they literally bet against the market. Exactly. They shorted it. They optioned it. They, they saw something that, you know, was an opportunity. Yep. And, uh, you know, that's what, that's where you, you know, that's when you invest when the market's down. You got to be contrarian right. Mm. And it's kind of scary because if you're contrarian wrong, wrong. <laughs> then you look like an idiot. <laughs> yeah. But if you're contrarian right, then you're rich. Yeah. But if it's consensus, you can't actually be rich because you're just average. Yeah. Right. And that's so, true. For example, I'll tell you right now, your riches, at least at this point in time right now, is probably not going to be in crypto, Not probably not going to be in Bitcoin because that's already been found out. Mm. Like, like there's 300 million Bitcoin holders. Yeah. Right. And, you know, it fluctuates and things like that. And maybe you can find a little bit of gains here and there if you luckily timed it right. But generally when an industry is quote unquote found out, then it's already saturated. It's already saturated. Right. Yeah. And that's what we saw with, um, it actually got oversaturated with NFTs and things like that. And people actually lost money, not made money. Yeah. Right. And so you actually want to go into the places where, there's not a lot of people right. where where there there isn't um, a strong conviction, but because you have a secret insight, because mm. you have an expertise in a certain area, you can actually draw conviction. And if it's also contrary to what everybody else thinks about it, that's even better. So one of the key things <laughs> that you just said then is you need to have an expertise. Yeah. Because otherwise I think you miss it. If you're just trying to be contrarian, Right. if you're just trying to <laughs> think, oh, everyone's going this way, let me go that way. I think that's a surefire way to actually miss the boat altogether. But that's right. to have an expertise, mm -hmm. do, do you think that there is a uh, undervalued element of expertise today in, in maybe the generation that are, approaching life from just live at large right now, yep. live it on credit, yep. but not actually spending time to develop an expertise in an area. Yeah. I mean, look, if you talk to any ultra successful person, CEO, founder, entrepreneur, at the end of the day, one of the consistent things that they'll tell you is it takes time. Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> it right. takes time. And what's working against this generation specifically is there's so many things that you could have access to that didn't take time. And so just that culture doesn't breed to, you know, we we're talking about Japan at the beginning of this pod, a Jiro Sushi of Dreams like character that right. had the patience to master his craft over decades and becomes the best at the world at rolling a sushi, mm. right? I'm not saying, okay, your pursuit should just be something as specific as that. All I'm saying is that greatness takes time mm. to, to develop an expertise. So you've been uh, building a local church for at this point, decades. Yep. Uh, and there are things that you know in your gut, uh, not even just based on market data, Barna research, yep. you know, all that type of stuff. You don't need to do demographic analysis and things like that to know if a church plant is going to succeed or not. Right, <laughs> right. Because you've developed a palate. You've yeah. developed an expertise, a taste for this craft that it had to take time. It takes time, but here's my question. Let's wind it back a little bit. Do you have to be an expert before you begin or is the expertise developed as you go? So, you know, mm. obviously when you started Overflow right. and, and from where, where it began as a, it, I would say it began as a core conviction. Mm -hmm. Like we need to, we need to unlock generosity mm -hmm. and cause generosity was definitely at that time. It, there was generous people, but they were limited to one little pathway. Mm. It was pretty much cash and credit, mm -hmm. but there were so many av other avenues to unlock generosity, but you didn't know all the ins and outs of no. building a company. Now you've become what I would consider somewhat of, a, of an expert in the industry. Mm. How, what's the level of competency or ex expertise do you need to begin and what can be grown along the way? Yeah. So I think it's actually a little bit of both. 
I do think a secret advantage, because there's this whole idea that Peter Thiel talks about that competition is for losers. Right. That's why you need to be super different and super distinct, kind of what we're talking about. If everybody is zigging, yep. you're, you're a zag. You're a clear, differentiated product offering found. Pastors all across the nation at churches might be looking for in mm. a solution and a product. What I didn't have an expertise in at all was fintech. Right. But coming, which is hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> because you've currently built one of the best fintech companies, <laughs> right. like even outside of the church space, just in the realm right. of fintech. Overflow is up there easily in the top 10 fintech companies right now in the world. Yeah, in terms of growth and trajectory for sure. Exactly. And and so what I think that I found out and this hindsight's 2020, but you know, there's this whole movement now that the experts are coining, oh, the future is actually verticalized fintech. Right. It's actually gonna be around brands that know how to build communities. Yes. And those communities are gonna be essentially banks. Correct. Um, and I stumbled upon that, what is now coined a thing, yeah. just by virtue of trying to create a specific financial services solution for the church space, which is one of the most powerful community-based entities Correct. on the planet. Right. And so that's what I'm saying is actually having, I think, enough skills and expertise and experience to be able to get things done, I think there's a baseline to that. Mm. But it's actually so powerful that you bring a background from something else right. into another space that you have zero expertise that's in, really good. and that's where magic can happen. So, so what we're saying is there is essentially some things you can build by bringing others into it. Exactly. So the technical, the engineering, all those kinds of things, uh, they were brought in, but your experience was the community space. Yes. Knowing the need. Yes. Seeing the market. Exactly. Um, I like that. I like that because you were an expert on the market and you developed a product. That's right. Yeah. Expert on the market, expert on the pain expert on the people yeah. that are behind the decisions that are made uh, for these organizations. And so, yeah, I think, I think that's really important. H how would you force function that? Because, you know, the thing is, the, the, the danger sometimes with, with church, and actually I feel like the, the thing, the tie that the church has always tried to battle is traditionalism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? And so Vive probably considered one of the more innovative churches in the world. What intentional decisions did you need to make along the way? And what do you need to even do today to right. make sure that it stays on the cutting edge? So I think you've got to wind back. In my opinion, let's wind back to at what point can you force function something, right? I think you mm. need the bare basics of am I passionate about this area? Yeah then I can force function in that. I can't force myself to be passionate about something because what we know <laughs> is that building a company is the most difficult thing you're ever going to do. Right. Okay, so you're going to... Well, the founder of NVIDIA, they asked him, hey, if you could do this again, would you do it? He said, no. Right. <laughs> he said, it's too hard. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, and I've been asked that question too. Would, would you, you know, knowing what you know about building the church, would you do it all over again? And, you know, I've always paused because I would never <laughs> want to say no to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, totally. But at the end of the day, I think the ignorance of not knowing, we jumped in so bullishly. Yeah. But if you knew how hard it was going to be, would you be so, I guess, ignorantly blissful right. in the process? So I think sometimes in starting a company, you really only have a few cracks at starting a few. It's true. Like 
transformative companies yeah. over your life. Yes. Because it requires the energy of your youth. <laughs> yes. It almost requires the ignorance, which is kind of conflicting to the t conversation about being an expert. True. And I think you have to be an expert at the pain, mm. an expert at the problem, mm. and have a willingness and an energy to go, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to run at this for the next five to ten years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, can you do that maybe when you're in your 40s or in your 50s? Mm. Uh, I think that's why we see founders, the prime founder ages in their 30s. Yeah. Because in your 30s, you're, as we've always, you know, highlighted that your 20s, they're your years for making mistakes. Yep. You're, you know, you're trying stuff, you're learning stuff, you're, you're coming out of college and maybe you're trying a few different industries and you're kind of really zeroing in on what you are trying to do. I think you're at an advantage if you can figure that out earlier in your 20s. Yeah. But, hey, it's not too late. You're 29, no. 28, 29, you're still going, man, I'm going to make a pivot now. Mm -hmm. I would suggest make the pivot now. Yes. Do it before your 30s because in your 30s you want to really lock in. Yes. You want to find your 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 kind of right, your niche, your, your zone. You want to start earning. Start earning. Yep. Yeah, building some wealth, uh, yep. getting some something behind you, uh, forming those relationships. Mm -hmm. And so your 30s, your 20s are years for making mistakes. Mm -hmm. Your 30s are your years for making it. Yeah. Make a name for yourself. Good. Make a, a run at something. Mm -hmm. Really hit your 30s and, and make some moves so that in your 40s you can make it for others. <laughs> because you've got to set up your kids now. Yeah. You're thinking about what are my kids going to be doing? True. Uh, am I now building stability yeah. so that this thing is around for longer? And how am I unlocking other people's dreams? And honestly, in my... 30s, uh, I was looking at establishing Vive Church. Yep. Uh, now in my 40s, I'm I'm unlocking campus pastors. Yeah. And I'm I'm trying to help them win and help them. So I've, I've seen this transition in real time, and you, you actually declared it uh, that this is going to be your decade of making pathways. Yes. Right for others, and it was so inspirational. I'm still in my 30s. I, I you know a, a step behind you right now, but I'm learning from you. What, what are you learning? Because you're early on in that journey right now, and I've seen that transition happen. Um, what are you learning in real time about making pathways for others? What I think it's making pathways for people. Mm. And, and it really, really comes around the people. Who okay. are the people that I'm investing in? Okay. Because I'm, I'm not just making pathways for anybody. Mm. I'm making pathways for specific people. Interesting. Because if the pathways that I'm making aren't just blank pathways for anybody to walk on, because it's actually about I'm, I'm helping that person walk the pathway. Wow. So God's put people in my world that my job is to identify within them what's the problem with their walking hmm. more than the path that they're treading on. Hmm. And if I can help them adjust the way they walk and the way they carry and the way they do things, it doesn't matter if there's a clear pathway or you know, a rocky pathway, a uphill pathway, they'll walk it if they know how to walk. If they know how to walk out the, the virtues, the characters, all the values, all that kind of stuff. I think my old perspective was even in the way that we've planted churches. Right. Right. We've looked at planting churches and we really used to emphasize the city. Right. It was like San Francisco, you know, Rome. Like it was really about that city. And, and my conviction now is any city can be planted in. Any, every city's hard and every city needs Jesus. Wow. The game changer is the person. Wow. It's the leader and their ability to plant and iterate and change and move and adapt and be followable, be dynamic. And I think the city is one thing. Um, I think there is a bare basic thing we can identify that really works with our style of church and the style of city, the style of people. You know, if, if we try and plant a church in a city that doesn't have upwardly mobile people that want to change the world, vibe just doesn't resonate. Right. Some cities are just looking for a community church that aren't going to push people. That's not vibe. It ain't vibe. We, we are going to aggravate, irritate, push you, uh, expect from you. But in those cities that, uh, you know, you find those people um, and you get the right leader that's inspirational, a leader that's somewhat likable but somewhat not likable as well. Uh, they need both. They need both. You need both edges. It's two edges of a of a sword. Is uh, I need to be able to challenge and ir and irritate. Yeah. But at the same time, inspire and ignite. Right. And uh, it's a unique blend. That's a unique blend. So you're talking about personalized pathways for people, and you've been honing that in. Um, I would say even in your 30s, you were doing that. I mean, I felt like 
you definitely did that for Kim and I before us, you did it in, in youth ministry, but you're doing it at another level now. Um, and I'm sure if I could guess that even though it's personalized, it all kind of follows a similar arc sure. in the yes. relationship, right? Where at some point there is this kind of divine connection. Obviously we believe in the sovereignty of God. So there is a point of just divine connection and kinship and chemistry and all that type of stuff. But then starts the journey when yes. there's that kind of commitment. Okay. We're in, we're, we're covenant relationship. We're yep. going to do this life together. Yep. It starts that journey. Take me through some components of that arc that you've seen consistent. Great question. <laughs> They're every person because I'm actually just curious myself. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a great question because, um, and I think for us, you're right. We probably did start a little earlier. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to remember, Kira and I got married when 21, 22. Yep. So we started having kids earlier. We got our first home by 23. Yep. So, you know, we definitely got a little advantage in that aspect. Um, but, you know, so it gave us a different perspective on what to see in people because we were looking for mm. what was in us. Okay. So identifying ourselves in people. Mm. I think that's the step one of the arc is if you're looking for that divine connection, is there something about that person or that couple that, man, I've just seen myself in them. Mm -hmm. I, I can see the way they think. I can see the way they act. Because mm. then you know what to shape, right? Good. But the arc goes like this. It goes quickly from, hey, I see something in you to then they have to see something in me that's worth following. Interesting. So it can't be me pushing them the whole way. It's got to be me igniting something in them and now saying, follow me. Paul said it. So Follow good. me, follow Christ. So there was something in Paul where he called people to the journey, but then he just took off. He's like, keep up, follow. So true. I'm going on this journey. And uh, I, can't, I can't be successful as a leader if I'm leading from behind pushing somebody. I've got to break through and say, follow me, get in my slipstream. Mm. So I think there's something about tucking. You, you spoke about this one time. I remember mm. you talking about uh, when you were riding uh, bikes. Yeah, you know, yeah. I remember the when you were riding the yeah. books and you were getting in the slipstream. Mm -hmm. and the what, peloton. Yeah, and what it means to get in behind, you know, and just drafting. that. Drafting. Drafting, that was the word you mm -hmm. used. And I think that's what you're doing as a leader. You're creating a draft. You're creating a slipstream for mm. people to be able to lock in. And along the way, they're not having to face all of the hurdles. That was my youth ministry years. So when I was in behind my past, the draft and behind him, yeah. he let me build a ministry. Yep. So we built this epic youth ministry. And I mean, in there, we were preaching, mm -hmm. we were praying for people, casting out demons. We were doing all the ministry stuff, but it was almost like we were drafting behind because we had the building provided for us. The electricity yeah. was paid for, the salaries were paid. We had a budget. It was cute, you know, all that kind of <laughs> stuff. And, and, and yet we were doing real ministry like a big kid, you know what I mean? But yeah. then it was when we stepped out and started our own church Oh my God, we felt the full force of the wind all of a sudden. Right, right. Now you got bugs in your face. Yes, so. in my teeth, <laughs> you know, and rocks in my, you know. So, and, and, and literally that's what it felt like. It felt like we came out from the draft, but we needed that season of drafting behind. Yeah. Because we, we didn't know how to do ministry and deal with the full effects. But because we learned ministry in that season, now I can deal with all the effects of the wind. And so I think that's the arc. It, I it, love that. It switches really quickly. Yeah, you, you identify. Yep. And then, and then, yeah, there is that point of decision. Well, well okay, you made a choice to, to call something out in somebody. Yep. And, and not, not everybody then chooses to respond to follow. Right. Some people you know, do, though. You see it with Elijah and Elisha. Mm, true. He, he notices something on Elisha. And I love the narrative because he literally goes up to Elijah and he just throws him his mantle, yeah. his coat. Great. That's, that's, and then Elisha really goes, saying, yeah. All right, leaves the oxen, puts the mantle, follows him. Right. And it's like, that was just like a, do you want to catch it? Follow me. So good. And it was like something super spiritual in that to go, I see you, I'm calling you, now follow me. Yeah. This is so interesting because that kind of means. You're not like a recruiter. No, no, <laughs> no, exactly. Right. Um, you're, you're trying to inspire, you're trying to ignite, but you're not necessarily trying to make the package so attractive. Exactly. <laughs> you, in, right? If anything, you're making the, the, the package very unattractive because mm. it's not what I'm going to do for you as your leader and all the places I'm going to take you and with me, you're going to go this far. No, it's like, hey, you want, are you down for this? Are you down for this journey? Right. Then follow me. 
So people are following you. Um, obviously you got dozens and dozens, uh, staff, non-staff, um, you're discipling on, on a direct basis. Um, and so what's your perspective? You are, I was actually talking to this person that leads this organization called Leading Second. Mm -hmm. um, he's the second chair for Kevin Gerald up in Champion Center, right. right? And so he has this language about like first chair, second chair, you know, all that type of stuff. Um, and so we we're just having a conversation, but I was thinking this, where you are a first chair leader in, and you 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 always also have a pastor. Uh, yep. There's people like Pastor Jurgen in your yep. life who, who you're following. Yep. Um, so we're always following somebody, but um, you're, you're a first chair leader at Vive and a lot of things that, that you do. What are you looking for in people that you're discipling? Because I get the sneaky suspicion that you're not necessarily, you're looking for disciples, but you're not necessarily looking for mini-me's. Yeah, no, I'm not really, it's funny because I've never really used that language, right? First chair, second chair. Yeah, yeah, chair. that's why I'm like, that's not our language, but yeah. that's kind of how some people talk about it. Yeah, and I don't know if I've ever looked for somebody Oh, I'm looking for second chair people. Right. I'm not look. I'm. I, if yes, anything, this, talk about this. This is what. I If do. anything, I'm looking for first chair people. Love it. I, I don't look for someone who's like just good enough or not going to have a vision, you know, or not. I'm looking for somebody who's like, who's give me a wall to run through. So good. I think we talked about it recently. Mm. If I have to whip somebody, they're the wrong person. Right. But if I have to pull them back and we have to have tough conversations and we have to go rounds, that's the person I love. Mm. I love I love shaping. I love putting a clay on the wheel, spinning that wheel so crazy that I put my hands on it, shape this thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, not, it's not just looking for someone who's just going to do for me. Right. I want someone who's going to literally going to launch out one day. Mm -hmm. That's what I think I love about being under under Pastor Jürgen, you know, and and that was a willing decision to say, I see what's on your life. Uh, I've seen your tr your proven track record. And we just spent like, you know, a week in Italy together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was an absolute riot. I mean, Pastor Jürgen is just the most, he's, he's the hilarious. The best. So everything's <laughs> funny. Um, but he is so deeply intentional in conversation and he's so insightful that you can be laughing one minute and then the next minute you're just having like a brain aneurysm with revelation. Right. It's just unbelievable. And I just think I, I love the way his mind works. Mm. I love the bigness of his thinking, uh, you know, just his willingness to act and make decisions and go for it. So I, I think from him, I'm not even taking a second chair when I'm with him. No. I'm still leading first chair, but I'm essentially drafting off what he's done, his experience. Beautiful. And I'm taking it into my first chair perspective, mm -hmm. not into a second chair perspective. Well, well, you just said it there, actually, insight that just unlocked me just then was that you said you submitted yourself to him. Yes. Yes. He wasn't asking submission from you. No. And I think that's what leadership is with a lot of people. Correct. Is they're like, hey, I'm first chair. And I need everybody to be submitted to me. Right. But That's, you're talking about a different leadership paradigm where it's like, no, no, no. It's, if I'm already making it a requirement for everybody under my quote unquote leadership to submit to me, I've already lost. You've already <laughs> lost because ultimately there's no prowess to your leadership that's followable. Wow. If you have a leadership uh I guess, prowess in the fact that there is something inspirational about your leadership. You don't need to ask people to follow you. Mm -hmm. They're going to wow. follow you. They're going to, they're going to go, Hey, I want to be under this. You're going to find people jostling and positioning to get around you and get under you. And I think that is that natural leadership that you want to lead. If you have to ask people, Hey, are you loyal? We've talked about this. Are you going to be loyal? Right. Well, what are the, that means you've already lost. Right. Because now you're holding them to a commitment. It's kind of the, maybe a strong word, but kind of the lazy way, I feel like, to do it. Yeah. Because if you take that uh, maybe more domineering tool away right. from the leader, let's right. just say you don't have that tool. You can't play that tool. Then you actually have to play the tool of being a visionary. You actually have to play the tool of articulating that vision in a compelling way. Yes. <laughs> well, pulling the loyal card is like shooting deserters. Right. You know, in the, in the army where deserters would get yeah. shot because it's like, well, we're going to don't go because we'll kill you. So now I'm like, well, do I actually want to go run into battle? Mm. Pulling the loyalty card is you're almost at that level. Are you going to be loyal? Are you right. going to be loyal? You know, and it's like, well, what if you shifted your leadership up rather than asking them to shift their perspective up? 
What if you shifted something that. into your dynamics? Yes. And the way you reinvent. Maybe the fact that you're nervous people are going to leave you means that there's something stale about your leadership or totally well this is why i'm gonna make a hard left really quick or maybe a hard right actually uh the direction i'm going but this is actually why i i appreciate the frequency and the tone of a vic okay that was a hard turn i like it not a hard left a hard right this man is yeah if you just you know take the the spiritual you know beliefs uh all that kind of stuff off the table he's common sense on how a country should be run based on what this country is built off right is and for me it's one of the tenets of being conservative is there's so much common sense now i was talking to vlad earlier and and we're just kind of trying to get an understanding of why people would be liberal and one of the liberal perspectives is just compassion extreme compassion right is kind of one of the tenets but I even disagree with what compassion is. So compassion for me is kindness, and the kindest thing I can be is have common sense. Right. Not just be passively put you and place you and look after you in your condition, but to pull you out of that condition, give you a pathway out, not keep you in it and coddle you in it. Right. And so I think there is we can't I think we're gonna be dangerous. It's dangerous when we call the the left or the liberal perspective compassionate. I think it's advantageous for you. Right. And so common sense means we can't just keep paying money to keep people in their condition. We're going to give a pathway out. And that's what Vivek is doing. He's creating yeah. pathways. And I just think it's a common sense policy. To, to lead with vision uh, is so paramount. I yes. mean, it's biblical. Without vision, right, people will perish. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, we need a renewed sense of vision in our country. We are in vision season. Also, yeah, we are for Vive Church, uh, and I'm so excited about that. It's like literally my favorite season of the whole year. Yeah, is is Vision season. Um, I know you're not gonna break any news on the pod, but what are you feeling in your spirit? Just maybe talk about the characteristics of what you feel in these seasons, and maybe even take people through a process because we talk to a lot of entrepreneurs on this pod, a lot of innovators, aspiring entrepreneurs, yep. leaders, VCs. What's your journey to even develop a vision? Because you, you, you actually do it every year. I don't know how many people do it every year, but you specifically do it every year. What does that process look like? You know, we, I mean, the vision that we have at Vive Church, it comes under the 50-year vision letter. So we've got a very large overarching vision that pretty much means um, we have picked every facet of society that we think the church should be intercepting in or yeah. intersecting. And so the 50-year vision letter, it's a very exhaustive letter that talks about how we see the church infiltrating society. Mm. And then what we do is I break that up year by year, pulling different elements out of that vision that I feel the Holy Spirit is leading on based off a prayer retreat. And then how are we going to articulate that direction in a bite size Come on. chunk? You know, I mean, we've got an elephant of a vision. We're going to start taking a bite at a, at a time. And, uh, you know, that's kind of what we do in breaking down the vision. Because if people knew that we had a billion dollar vision, right, that would just intimidate everybody. Yeah. But can we break it down to this year being a $5 million vision sure. or a $10 million vision? You know, so so really it makes it more palatable, even though it means we've got to stretch our, mm -hmm. our bite bigger than we've, you know, maybe bit before. Um, and, and then can we digest it? Right. So I think the, the vision process is, it's an interesting one. I think it's actually 
more emotional and spiritual than even uh, mental. It's okay. not like I'm Talk just trying that. to calculate what to do. I'm trying to feel where are we at as a church. Yeah. So it's it's quite a uh, a sensor a sensory process. Yeah. Of leading up the months leading up to to vision. I'm trying to both have my finger on the pulse of where we're at as a society, yeah. as a church. Uh, I'm talking to families. I'm talking to business leaders. Yeah. I'm trying to get a pulse check on what is the atmosphere of our church. Yeah. I'm talking to our campuses, yeah. our campus pastors, leaders. I'm having so much conversation. On the other hand, I'm trying to listen to what's happening in the world. Good. But while I'm listening to what's in the world, if I bring this all the way back to what we started the conversation with, If the world's zigging, I'm looking to Zach. Yes. So I look at this throughout the Bible. I look at this with Daniel. Mm -hmm. So Daniel, he was told not to pray. Yep. So what does he do? He goes home, opens the windows, and prays anyway. (laughs) You you look at this with Esther. Yeah. Esther was told, oh, man, if you go and bring this before the king, you could lose your life. She goes, if I die. She does it anyway. Wow. You look at this at Jesus. Jesus walks into the temple and he sees what the temple's become. He doesn't just say, ah, oh, well, I might as well go along with the plan and put my own booth up. No, he he goes, he makes a whip. Mm. So he takes some time. He thinks about this. Premeditated. He comes back and clears the temple anyway. Like there is a, there is this feeling that you got to look at what's the world doing and I'm going to bring a disruptive and different approach to so it. So are you, are you kind of... A- discerning, you know, okay, my conversations with people in the church and, oh man, it kind of sounds like it's being more influenced by the world than by kingdom. Yes. I need to bring in Zag right now. Correct. Exactly. So good. So I'm trying to see, are the people picking up the narrative? Mm. Are the people intimidated by what they see? Are the, are the people, you know, and this is, okay, what is discernment? We talked about this even this morning in a staff meeting. Someone was you know, asking a question about uh, to, to my wife because uh, she's so discerning. Very discerning. And I just had to illuminate, you know, the gift of discernment is developed through pain. The, the gift of discernment is developed through people lying to you enough where you start to learn the language of lies so that when someone's telling you what they claim to be truthful but the tone of it is lies because you've heard a lie enough. Right. And you've got to be willing to go through that process to become discerning. Wow. Like I could I could go to the Bronx or yep. somewhere in New York and I see a dark alley and I just go, hey, I'm going to walk down there. If I get, if I do that enough and get mugged, right. that's how I learn or watch or hear stories about people getting mugged in dark right. alleys. Right. That actually should give me a discernment to go, yeah. maybe I'm not going to walk down that dark alley. Interesting. So that's a developed skill, mm. right? It's like my dog. So he got bit on, on the nose in, during the summer mm-hmm. uh, by a rattlesnake and nearly died. Mm. And as I was at the at the vet clinic, paying thousands of dollars to keep my dog alive, uh, literally the 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 guy at the clinic was talking about how they capture these uh, rattlesnakes mm-hmm. and they take their their fangs out and they train their dogs with toothless snakes mm. that they still strike, they still have the rattle, but they can't bite, mm. and it trains the dog to hear that rattle and know to avoid the snake out in the wild. Great. And so I think that that's how you develop discernment. Have I experienced the rattle? Have I experienced Mm -hmm. the bite? Therefore, my my discernment's dialed in. Yeah, but how do you do it? Because I feel like we are kind of in unprecedented times since we started Vibe Church. I do feel like the the climate is not fully something that we've experienced in the last 12 years, right? So let's just talk. I mean, there's so many factors, yep. but let's just talk about the financial factor. Yep. Uh, before May 2022, it's literally been up to the right, looking like a hockey stick yep. for m- most people in this area financially. Yep. And for the first time ever, it's flat or down flat for, may, for yeah. many people, or they lost their job. Yep. Um, and so it's, it's kind of an unprecedented thing that we're facing, um, leading our church through. Yeah. And so... Without experience the exact situation, how do you then bring your leadership and discernment to a situation where you maybe never seen before? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely new territory mm-hmm. and new ground. And I'm definitely approaching this vision completely different to how I've approached them in the past. Mm. The past has def- has most certainly been, 
okay, how can I, uh, how can I use the momentum yeah. of stock growth, yeah. of Silicon Valley tech, totally. all these things, and how can I really draw on that momentum and just unlock people mm -hmm. uh, to what they've got to release towards the vision? Now, I really, if I'm going to be completely honest, I'm more excited about this vision because this is an opportunity for an incredible miracle. So good. It's not just people giving off the top. So good. This means people have to dig into sacrifice. So good. And it's not even based on the amount that we raise in the capital campaign, but what's that going to unlock on pe in people as in they people. start giving from sacrifice, not surplus? Mm. I think in the last decade, we've definitely seen people give from surplus. Mm -hmm. But now we have an opportunity to give from sacrifice. It's brilliant. And we've said this before, sacrifice is the base element of faith. Oh, yeah. That unless it costs you something, are you really stretching in faith? It carries an atmosphere, an aroma. Yes. And the Bible describes it as sweet smelling. Exactly. It's acceptable. It's pleasing exactly. to God. These are the things that pleases God. And, and so now so, we're setting, we're really set up for a miracle. We're, we're set up for our faith to grow to whole new heights and whole new levels. And so mm. I think, you know, I mean, it's just this weekend. I'm pumped. I'm running in like <laughs> so excited. And, 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 and can I give you another secret? It's actually less pressure on me Love because uh, there's three stages of a vision. Okay. One, it's really pursuing God for the vision. Yep. What is it that we're presenting yep. to, in, in my setting, to our church? Two, it's presenting it in such a way where people grab it and mm -hmm. they commit to it. Mm -hmm. The hardest stage is when the people commit and give because yep. now I've got to do it. <laughs> right, true. <laughs> so it goes pressure off me onto people and then it goes back from people onto me. <laughs> hey, that that's so true. So I realize the easiest point is this weekend where I put the pressure on the people. So that's how you, that's how you can deliver it with joy. With joy. And that's why you have so much fun on these weekends. I, I love it. I love it. It's <laughs> the greatest privilege. Vision for me, vision casting is the greatest privilege of my position as a lead pastor because I get to really bring in many ways off the mountain what I felt God's put in my spirit for the last several months. And I get to present it in such a way that I'm excited and it hopefully is igniting excitement in the people. But I'm putting the problem before them. I'm putting the gap that I feel that in many ways in con combination and communication with God I've created. Yeah. This is the gap for where we're going to go. And I get to put it on people so they can feel the pressure yeah. and the tension and the sacrifice. And then when we hit it, now I'm like, oh, man. Yeah, and I, I love what you said earlier about how it's it's a spiritual, it's an emotional, it's a sensory kind of uh, discerning activity. Yeah. Because I, I, I do think that your ability to translate and contextualize to where people are at so they can receive it is so important. I was actually just talking to my team about this at Overflow, you know, talking to finance and HR, and we're heading into this whole new season at Overflow of expansion. And Are you going to talk about what just happened? Yeah, so um, I don't think I can reveal the partner yet. We'll do a big press release so we can reveal the name of the partner, but right. we'll just close our Series B. Close your Series B. <laughs> $20 million investment uh, into Overflow, and that's just going to lead to uh, us being able to do what we're doing at greater levels. Can and I just so, pause there for a moment yeah, yeah. because, I mean, that's cool. Do what you do at greater levels. I love that, but <laughs> let's just pause for a second. Like, I don't know how many companies are closing Series B rounds no, right no, now. No, 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 no. Like, could we probably count them on one deck of cards, right? Yeah, like probably, there's, yeah. There's, can't be that many who are doing significant there's Series not. B rounds. No. Nope. And um, to, to, to close that uh, $20 million round, is, yeah. it's fantastic. Oh, it's phenomenal. Yeah, and we... We feel blessed. Obviously, you know, uh, the grace of God, the hand of God has been on the company. But also, you know, like you said, um, it comes in, you, you position yourself for this, right? You, you're partnering with God yep. um, and you position your, yourself for this and, and, and you're believing for it, you pray for it. And, and, then, and then it's like, oh, okay, now time to get to work. Now time to get to work. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Because, I mean, it puts fuel on yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it should, uh, I, I would say, accelerate the build process. Yeah. But that complement yeah. of Huge. someone investing that significant amount of money in the next, in the next round actually now quickly becomes pressure yes. to perform. Yes. And so I think a visionary has to be able to take both sides. Of course. To be able to fuel the, the funding, but then mm -hmm. now take the funding and say, well, how am I going to not let this buckle me and break me? But how do I actually 
ride that energy that it mm-hmm. creates. Because mm-hmm. what a what an investment like that does, whether it's a capital campaign in a church or a Series B in a company, mm-hmm. it actually creates a swell. Yes. It creates like a tidal swell that's now pushing a force. That's right. So you've got to become an expert paddler to paddle up to speed to catch that wave. And, and that's what I love about you know, the style of leadership that you're talking about that we we live, right, and that I've learned from you is this, it can't be spreadsheet leadership. No, no. So when I'm talking to my, you know, finance team, HR team, and, and they're giving me these analysis and, you know, hey, you know, these are the comp levers and this is how we can incentivize, you know, all that type of stuff. It's good. I want to know it. I want to know benchmarks. I want to get this input. But at the end of the day, what's going to guide my decisions and my conversations with mobilizing the current team and mobilizing future team that comes on um, is actually kind of what we talked about earlier, personalized pathways. Yes. Because there is an energy. Yes. There is a motive. There is a motivation that each person has actually specifically uh, within the organization, within the team. And if you're trying to lead people through a system of spreadsheet leadership, right? Uh, it just doesn't work. It right? doesn't work because for them to follow you, there needs to be something about you yeah. that they like the direction yeah, and that where you're going is where they want to end up. Mm. Mm. And it can't just be like on a spreadsheet. Mm. It's got to be a tone. It's got to be confidence. It's got to be a, so good. it's got to be a style. It's got to be a vision that's cast in such a way that, Hey, where you're going now, my decision is I'm going with or without you. Right. But I want to bring you. Yes. Because where I'm going is not dependent on you. Does that make sense? 100%. So if I'm looking to recruit, what I'm saying is where I'm going is dependent on you. So please come. How can I convince you? What can I give you to make sure you come? Because my future is dependent on you. Wrong premise. Wrong premise. Mm. I'm the leader. I'm going. Yeah. And I want you to come. Yeah. Trains leaving. It's, you can jump on it. Yes, we're, yeah, exactly. It's gonna be a great train ride. Yep. You can jump on it, but um, it's leaving with or without it's you. It's going. And that actually gave me a full circle moment because I don't think my previous manager at Google's listening to this pod, so I'm just gonna say it. Anyways. Probably not. <laughs> is is that's actually every time in industry that I've uh, felt the the urge to maybe transition or maybe my season's up is when I started feeling like, oh. I don't want to be like the person that's managing me in five years. <laughs> so good. <laughs> like, like I think it's good for them, but it's not for me. I don't want to, I'm not, I don't want to, if I look like that in five years, I don't want to be that for me. Um, and so, so it, it just goes back to your thing. But you know, what's convicting now is I'm on the other side of that. Oh, I, right. I need to be that person that people want to be in five years. hundred <laughs> percent. You know, can I tell you a story? Um, Many people never heard this story, but when Kira and I were in youth ministry, one of the main motivators that really got us talking, because we were loving youth ministry. Mm-hmm, yeah. Don't get me wrong. Youth ministry was one of the most phenomenal seasons of our life. It was fun. It was adventurous. We were doing all kinds of crazy things and getting away with it and just, you know, <laughs> doing, like, uh, it was just such a radical season of life. Yeah. And, uh, in that season, what caused us to start thinking about what's beyond youth ministry is we looked at the lives of the youth pastors that we took over from. Mm. And they uh, literally had retired probably another 10 years past their their due date. And where they retired is they, they were excited about moving into a trailer park. Oh, and no. they had bought this trailer park. Now, admittedly, it was by the beach. Okay. Okay. In a place called Stockton. <laughs> okay. Uh, but it was a trailer park. <laughs> and literally, Kira and I said, is that, is that what awaits us? And, and it was enough motivation to say that exact sentence. We don't want that. Right. Now, that wasn't the cause for us to go, well, hey, we better go and build a church so sure, that we don't sure. have yeah, a trailer totally, park. Yeah. But it was the motivator to say, oh, this is where we are right now is not the end destination. Yeah. We need to start making some bigger plans for our life because mm. trailer park ain't the goal. Mm. We're not living on a youth pastor salary. Right. We're going to actually start unlocking way bigger people and way bigger industry and move to a place that's going to influence the world. And what's what's been beautiful about this whole journey, right, is that I feel like part of the gift of God it's connected to the ignorance we all had when we started Vibe Church. Right. Is that He's provided um, 
another measure of exposure, but the right exposure at the right time. Yes. Right. Not too much exposure to be like a tease. Right. But just enough of the next picture, enough enough of the next puzzle to be so excited, to be present, yep. and to to be so purposeful in our present. But to have a framed future that is also, man, I'm excited for the now. I'm excited for the next step because he's continually surrounded and locked different people and places for us to be like, oh, wow. Okay, cool. That's next. Exactly. And I'm excited about that. And I think that not knowing what's next is what's exciting. So good. So vision isn't meant to fill everybody with a clear vision of what's next. Right. It's, it's meant to get them excited to take the unknown step. Mm. And, uh, that's why I even think I'm excited, honestly, about what's going on politically in our country. Yeah. Like the, the candidates of Vivek, uh, I'm still, still, I still like DeSantis. Come I'm on, DeSantis. Like, hey, come on, bro. Come, come on, man. <laughs> Increase the personality. You yeah. got this. <laughs> Show them something. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I think there are some great candidates. I even think the mix, all the stuff that's happening within the GOP. I think, you know, all the tension, I think it needs to rattle. It needs to come, you yeah. know, they need to invent a new day and a new team. We have to. All that kind of stuff. And I think that that excites me, the unknown of what can happen, mm -hmm. because I know that God has things that I'm not even expecting. Right. He's got rewards, promises, opportunities, different style of ministry, all the things that are coming. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's just interesting that the, my personality as a minister of Jesus Christ, who was called to bring transformation to the world, um, and to ultimately redeem society, bring heaven to earth. Uh, I find that uh, the unknown is exciting <laughs> because I'm not a traditionalist. I'm not mm. religious. I'm not locked in. I mean, I just had this huge Instagram. I'm not going to say it a battle because I didn't, I didn't do anything. I just literally made about a post women? about Halloween. About Halloween, yeah. I did a post about Halloween. That was yesterday. How is this still a thing? I don't understand. Well, that was, that was what I got the indication and man, I've just seen so many religious people commenting on there about how can you, cause we're celebrating demons or something. Well, I think that's their perspective. I think <laughs> they're really bought into the modern marketing that Halloween is an evil thing. And I think that they have, they have certainly sold themselves from somebody who's told them that, you know, taking scriptures out of context, don't participate in the world, don't be of dark things. You know, people make up the classic scripture, be in the world, but not of the world. Right. It's not a verse, everybody. It's actually not a verse. Okay. So it's, it's, <laughs> stop quoting it like it's a verse. Um, and there, there is all these, these elements, but I, I went out to Los Gatos yeah. last night. Yeah, we were there too. There had to be like 5,000 people. Incredible. There was, I spoke to somebody. I went up to the door. I'm like, hey, can I just ask, what's your budget for candy? Yeah. They said $1,000. Come on. They spent $1,000 willingly yeah. to be able to hand out candy to all these kids who were dressed up as Pokemon or yeah. something else. Yeah. And I'm literally looking for, do you know how many churches would love oh my God. for exposure like this? Where is Where are the Christians that are just being like, man, I've budgeted a couple thousand bucks to give yes. out candy. And I'm just saying, hey, God bless you. Great yes. to see you. Do you know how many people were saying God bless you out there? Dude, it's it was like... unbelievable. It's so crazy. I, it, historically, Halloween actually is a Catholic tradition yeah. that got hijacked, you know, in the 60s by Satanists wanting to claim it. Okay, here's the thing. Here's the reality. If Satanists tomorrow wanted to claim Christmas, are we going to stop celebrating Christmas? But Vance, that is... <laughs> that Vance, that is the narrative right now. Literally, it doesn't make sense. That, that it's another pagan holiday. So I just think it gets ridiculous in... God can redeem all things except for that day. <laughs> exactly. Okay? So he can only redeem 364 days. <laughs> but my, but my point is, uh, I think we just... Uh, I like the unexpected. Yeah. I like catching the devil by surprise. Mm. I like just seeing the church mobilized. Even though the unexpected sometimes leads to getting punched, getting knocked down, failing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're the, they're the byproducts. I haven't been punched lately. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't get punched. But I meant metaphorically speaking. <laughs> oh, a little metaphorical punch now and then. A little life punch. Yeah. Yeah. Life will punch you. You know, so you always have a plan. Mike Tyson says you always have a plan until you get punched in the face. So good. <laughs> and so, um, no, it's good. I think we are in unprecedented times. Yes. We are That's good. Uh, hearing 
unexpected things just happening constantly. And there is this very negative narrative. Um, there is very much, you know, an increased sense of doom and gloom narrative, I would say. But the future, I believe, belongs to the optimist. Okay, so how do you stay? Let me ask this question. The future belongs to the optimist. If we're talking to some people out here and they're saying, I like listening to the hype pod because <laughs> you guys seem to be optimistic about everything. <laughs> but the reality is they're living with the threat of World War III. They're, yeah. they're under the, the, the fear like, hang on, there's tensions going on diplomatically across the world. We've got more nations making their alliance stances with either Palestine or Israel. And, and, and how do you stay optimistic in the midst of the potential, I don't know if we're going out too far, nuclear war, all that kind of stuff. And and what about the, the person who's now being despondent and even getting started with a company because they're like, is the world going to be around? I've even seen pastors on my Instagram starting to become despondent. Right. Like just in despair. Right. Right. With the state of the world. I don't know. I'd, I honestly don't think I have a fully formed opinion. I'd love your take as my pastor on this, but you know, just for me, uh, I try to lean in on God's sovereignty. Obviously I know that could seem trite. Um, but you know, do we really believe it? <laughs> right. Um, does he really have a plan? Um, and specifically, you know, the world is dark, uh, for sure. The world is jacked up. It's always been jacked up by the way, newsflash. Um, sure. but do we actually specifically believe that he has a plan for the church? Does he have a plan um, for the church uh, becoming more beautiful? Does he yeah. have a plan for the church that he's going to come back for, the Bible says, without spot and blemish? And if I can believe that, then I can believe that he wants to partner with me to be part of that, to be part of his redemptive plan. And so I, I do think we can be realists. We can be uh, not, you know, completely unaware and ignorant and just being kind of those people that are like overly positive, but like, you have no idea. Dude. Right. You know what I mean? Cause that's annoying. Yeah, it is. So we can be, we be realist, but we can also, um, take the reality and be innovators, right? We can take the reality and solve problems. Yes. We can take the reality and be leaders. Yes. That's what the world really needs. Right. Yeah. I don't know. How about you? How do you, I mean, it's, it seems, uh, heavy now. It's like how, to, to me, sometimes I do oscillate. It, it's kind of a battle when I talk to my, you know, Kim about it and stuff. We're just talking about it and, you know, heading to bed and things like that. And we're like, man, this is crazy. Yeah. Uh, how do you overcome that? You know, I, I, I like to, what I enjoy about it is having ro actually more serious conversations. Good. Rather than every conversation just being surface level. Good. And sometimes you can go through life where it's like, okay, we've got some surface level conversations. Yeah. But now we're really digging into what is the orientation and what's happening behind the scenes. Yeah. And, you know, I've always got a rule is don't react yeah. uh, or respond on social media too close to something. Good. You know, because sometimes I think you realize after a while, oh, man, I wish I could retract that thing because yep. I feel like I went out too hot. Exactly. And uh, I do it with kids. You know, I come in real hot with kids <laughs> and, and I'm like, hey. And they're like, hey, they just woke up, you know. <laughs> but I don't want to do that with social media where I just come in hard and be like, you know, put my stance out there, but not knowing all the information. Yeah, yeah. And then to really start to learn and realize, oh, man, I am i don't want to be just a pawn in this economic totally. world where, uh, you know, there is, there is big bank behind yes. warfare and there is yes. big banks uh, and industrial complexes and big policies yes. that – uh, definitely affecting people. And if you boil it down to your immediate response is obviously compassion towards people dying and all that kind of stuff. But what are you protesting? Right. Are you protesting one country invading another country? Mm -hmm. Or are you protesting the protagonists that are behind the scene and that are ultimately looking for opportunity for right. invasion and spending and all that kind of stuff? Right. So I think uh, you'd be, become inquisitive yeah. is a tool for me yeah. to not be despondent. Good. I, I find inquiring and being interested and investigating actually becomes a way of educating myself. And therefore, inviting robust conversation. Inviting robust conversation. Wow. I want to challenge my ideas against someone who, who doesn't agree with me because it sharpens me. Mm. It actually makes me actually want to bring facts and links mm. and, and articles. And I love being able to do that. 
So good. That was a good high pod. Yeah, we, uh, we went over time. We went a little bit over time, but I thought it was a good conversation, a, a needed conversation. Um, and uh, just appreciate this space. Thanks, Pastor Adam. Thanks, fans. Come on. <laughs>